Good evening, everyone. My name is George Ofori, and um, I'm a professor at the London, London South Bank University. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome all of you here to the, to the inaugural lecture of Professor John Obas Ebohon. I've been told I have between five and seven minutes, but I've told the one who told me that I, I need the seven instead of the five. <laughs> So time me, and um, at, on seven minutes, let me stop, because I have eight pages to read, and I will, I'll go through them very carefully. The formal part is this, that the presentation of an inaugural lecture is a significant milestone in the academic career of a full professor. The inaugural lecture provides an opportunity for the professors being inaugurated to present their careers so far, to introduce their field of expertise to a wider audience, and to update their colleagues on their current and future plans with regard to research. For the schools where the professors are based, the event is a chance to celebrate their achievement across the staff and the student body, to strengthen the existing relations that they have with industry and with the community, and to catch up also with their alumni. And I'm glad that we have um, some of our alumni here. And then also to initiate new conversations and new collaborations as well. For a university like ours, inaugural lect le lectures represent an essential component of their public events program because they provide uh, an opportunity to engage with the general public, creating wider awareness of the nature and the benefits of the university's teaching and the university's research as well. For these reasons, this university is very much delighted to have restarted this series of inaugural lectures after the COVID-19 pandemic. Meeting in person feels really very special because it facilitates a greater richness in understanding. It also enables a wider range of and a greater flexibility and depth in the discussions during the post-event reception, which will happen tonight as well. And it lends greater gravity to the occasion of such an important milestone in the academic's life. As we are meeting in person, let me remind you of the etiquette of such events. Um, it's like the house rules. So first, let us all switch off our mobile phones. And then remember that this event is being recorded. And I hope all of us do not mind being recorded. Because in the end, a collection of um, these inaugural lectures are placed in a, in a, in, in a, in a huge base on, on YouTube, and I've been told it's really attractive to go and have a look. So those who are not able to join us here can watch it. I've told them that they, can, they can watch the inaugural lecture by John very much later on. The third point is that the toilets are very much well signposted outside, and um, you should find your way to a place that you need at any time that you need it. Finally, I'm also um, to, to let you know that we're not planning any fire test, a fire alarm test tonight. And so if the alarm bell actually does go, then it means um, we should make our way in a very orderly fashion towards the signposted fire exit. So, so the official part is finished. Now allow me to introduce Professor Obas John Ebohon to you. John got his PhD in Energy and Development Economics from the University of Leicester in 1990. He'd completed an MA in Development Economics at that same university in 1984. His first degree, a BA in Economics, was from Staffordshire University in 1983. And I use this word remarkably. Remarkably, 10 years after his PhD, John then obtained an LLM in environmental law from De Montfort University, also in Leicester in the year 2000. So listen for the word Leicester because it, comes, it keeps coming up. <laughs> John was appointed a professor of sustainability and environmental law in the School of the Built Environment and Architecture in this university in 2017. In 2019, he successfully merged two centers um, of research that we had in our school into the Center for Integrated Delivery of the Built Environment. And John has been the lead of that center 
uh, since then. In this role, he leads the multidisciplinary group of academics uh, doing research. He's also been the director of internationalization and recruitment and also uh, the marketing of the school as well. Uh, this he's been doing since 2018. At the university level, John chairs the ORA committee. He also serves on the university sabbatical committee. Currently teaches um, a module for a group of MSc courses that we have. The module is on construction finance and economics. And previously he taught on the um, MSc in environmental management um, course as well. John describes his research interests and expertise as spanning energy, sustainability, development, mainstreaming, and, and mainstreaming sustainability into built environment policies, construction industry development, construction demolition wastes, construction industry development in developing countries, and sustainable procurement systems. You may ask, what does this all mean? So we asked John. And John said, for the layperson, this means, and this is John speaking, my field of expertise is on unraveling the conflicts between energy, sustainability, and development, focusing on how to mainstream possible solutions into policies and strategies generally, and particularly within the built environment sector. Uh, with this research interest, John has authored about um, 100 pa papers which have been either uh, published in journals or have been presented at conferences. He's also done four book chapters. He's edited and um, co-edited four, four books and conference proceedings as well. His works have been in some of the top journals in our field. And one thing that I want to um, highlight, uh, perhaps you might want to look for it, is that John led the development of a, a MOOC. It's a massive online course, uh, which we did with um, the CIOB, the, the Chartered Institute of Building. And that MOOC has been taken by more than 14,000 people from, uh, around, uh, from around the world. He sits on the editorial board of many, um, many journals. John has secured uh, research grants uh, amounting to about 1.6 million pounds, and they've been from a number of um, agencies, the British Academy, the Br British Council, the Royal Society, uh, the, and the, Her Her the, sorry, the Harold Samuel Research Prize, and also Innovate UK. I just want to highlight the research that he did. Uh, the title is Harmonize, Harmonization of Construction Health and Safety Practices and, compliances, and, and Compliance in Southern African Development Community. I, I always like to use the word countries as well. And there are 17 countries that they studied in this research. He supervised um, and also examined up to about 50 PhD students in the UK and overseas as well. And I looked at the 15 students uh, that he actually supervised as PhD students and all the way to the end. They come from many countries. They come from Cyprus, from Egypt, from Ghana, from Lebanon, from Nigeria, from Sierra Leone, from Sudan, from Uganda, and from the UK. There was a period in the 1990s when John was actually involved in leading a capacity building program in South Africa, it's soon after the new dispensation started. And in this program, he uh, led the, uh, the, the production of three MPhils in South Africa, who actually, um, uh, I would say, pioneered the involvement of um, non-whites in teaching in South Africa. He doesn't mention this a lot, but I do. John maintains an active and external engagement. He serves on the International Advisory Board of the UN Habitat World City Report, and he's a member of um, the Sustainability Ex Experts Advisory Group for two councils, Lambeth and Sabuk. Uh, he's, he's sat on, um, well, he chaired the working group on supporting lower carbon local e economies on the rebuilding, on rebuilding a resilient Britain program. He is currently the chairman of a group that's called um, Green Hub Africa. Uh, you, you can see it online. Now when we ask John to tell us any fun facts interesting hobbies, things that people may not know about you. Uh, John's only response was, supports Liverpool Football Club. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've known John for many years, but I wanted other people to speak about him. So I wrote to quite a number of people, his students, his colleagues, his collaborators, people who like him and people who may not like him. As well. And I, I got a huge volume of material, 
So over the past few days, I've had the big task of trying to put them together. I have seven minutes, and I think I'm coming to the end of the seven minutes. So I'll summarize what um, they told me in three points. The first point is that John is a top-class researcher and teacher, an expert in sustainable development in the built environment, who is highly respected around the world and has made significant contributions to the formulation of actions to improve the quality of life of people, especially in African countries. He's dedicated to his students, and he cares about their experience when he teaches them, and then also about their welfare after he has taught them, while they're students and after they graduate also. That was the first point, John as a teacher. Then second point, John is a mentor who selflessly gives of his time to develop his graduate students and the early career researchers, whether they're his colleagues here or anywhere else um, around the world. And he's, he's been described by uh, many of those who wrote to me that he has a, he has a sharp ability to bring together uh, multidisciplinary teams, get them to work together, uh, even if their ideas are different, and in the end, they come up with very useful um, you know, programs, initiatives, and strategies as well. The third point is that John is open-minded, he's forthright, but he's generous, and he cares very much about social justice. He devotes his time to doing good in the community. So if my seven minutes are not up, allow me to actually read uh, a few points that people actually wrote. The first one is this. John believes and practices social justice. He sees humanity first before anything else. He has mentored a number of academics and leaders across the globe. John sees good in everyone. He believes everyone has the potential to be impactful, and he's keen to help realize the potential to do good and be impactful in people. He gives his time very freely to any good cause, and the last sentence that this person wrote is that John has a big heart. And this is a former boss of John. He may not know the person. Another one is this. Professor Ebohon recognizes other people's skills and helps them to be established. The person says this. I am a testimony of this. He has a sympathetic ear when listening to others, and he always goes out of his way to help, to stabilize, and to motivate. He's a mentor, indeed. And then the person ends like this, like a candle that consumes itself in order to light the way for others. John is that kind of a mentor. I want to read this one, too. This is from a long-standing friend. He says, Professor Ibohom is much loved by many for his kindred spirit. He has the uncanny ability to support and enable anyone in need to succeed. And this is the part I like. He is also the resident and unofficial Lord Mayor of the BME community in Leicester. I, I told you to, to listen out for Leicester. And this, the part that I like is actually not coming. Now, it, let, let, me, let me continue. He's the resident and unofficial Lord Mayor of the ABME community in Leicester, where the sheer mention of his name in that region immediately resonates, and this is primarily because of the good deeds that he's done in that community. All very good, but then it can't be so good because there's another one here. Now, when I think about John, these are things that spring to mind. His generosity and his thought, thoughtfulness, still good. His commitment to being, to, sorry, his commitment to helping international students, also being good. But then this person goes on to say his inability to use IT. <laughs> and then the next one is even more interesting. The number of times he's either lost or forgotten his passport. <laughs> and I'll finish with this one. John is an exemplary, exceptional, contentious, proud, and altruistic researcher, teacher, and academic who deserves every accolade that comes his way and which are well overdue. John is a revolutionary activist. John 
YNWA. Some people know what this means. I'm not going to explain it. John may want to explain it if he likes. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Professor John Obas Ibohon. Thank you very much, John. Thank you all for coming. I'm delighted to see all of you here, uh, especially given uh, what we have today, the train strike and also the weather as well, inclement weather, that you could make it here today. I'm very, very much you know, delighted. Most of those things that have been said about me, I wasn't born with them. There are other people who planted those in me, and I really like to acknowledge them. Uh, Professor Nick Adnett was uh, my tutor. Very first day of walking into the university, we had tutorial group. And when you enter the class, first person, your name, you say the country you come from. And when it got to my turn, I said, uh, I'm John Eberhorn, I'm from Nigeria. He said, ah, you are from that country that is so well and down with natural resources, but cannot generate electricity for more than two hours a day. <laughs> so you are going to be an energy economist, and you are going to solve that problem. And <laughs> I left that place puzzled. I never thought that I could come out and see somebody who knows the kind of problems that we have, even you know, more than me. It's talk. You know? So when I finished my, my first degree, and uh, I was looking to uh, progress. He recommended that I go to Leicester University to look at uh, uh, development economics, which is what I did. And uh, when I finished that, uh, I had uh, uh, Catherine Price, who uh, was one of those um, energy specialists. It was during the time we were privatizing energy. You know, public sector economics had just evolved, and so. Um, she was working in that uh, area, an advisor to British, you know, gas. And then says, well, there's an opportunity to do uh, a PhD. And so I said, okay. Uh, he said, where are you from? <laughs> I said, Nigeria. He goes to me, you are the right candidate for this program because I want to know why you've been flaring 75% of your gas reserve for almost 15 years, just burning it, and yet you cannot generate electricity. Do you know Nigeria is the only country along the whole of West African coast that has all the possible sources of energy, coal, gas, geothermal, solar, hydro. And he said, what is the problem? So I said, okay, let me look at economic development and how energy, you know, interacts with development. And then uh, I came across late Professor Subrata Gatak. Everything that he said about me today, I learned from most of these people, pioneer. Subrata Gatak was actually the person that endeared me into teaching, lecturing. Because he's a guy that could teach you. I never knew how he did it, but we were all fascinated. He would give you a lecture and give you 20, 50 references. In that time, don't forget, we didn't have recording uh, uh, instrument, okay? So we thought, how do we know that this guy is actually giving us <laughs> the right sources? So we would divide ourselves up and say, you take five of his sources, five, five, we come and combine all of them and go to the library and you wouldn't find a dot missing. And that was unbelievable. And so we wanted to be like him. So when we, we, we mention or you hear the university saying inspirational teaching, you know, this guy embodied it, okay? And then late Professor Peter P.M. Jackson, I wouldn't be here today without him. Because at this time, uh, most of you, when I came to the UK to study one pound was about 80 cent Nigerian equivalent. Halfway through, it doubled. My tuition fees just doubled overnight. And now, the same one pound is 950 naira. 
okay, overnight. And a lot of us were stranded. And he had to pull some ground together to allow myself and three other guys, you know, continue. And uh, when I uh, successfully, or through, during my PhD, I, there was a part-time teaching job going on at Leicester <coughs> Polytechnic. I applied on uh, <laughs> a Wednesday. <laughs> I got a rejection letter on a Friday. I thought, wow, these guys must be very, very efficient. You know? <laughs> so I was in my room. Professor Jackson called me and says, could you go to Leicester Polytechnic as it was then? Uh, they asked me to send one of my good students to come and take up some job there. So I went in. And I was not even interviewed, and I was asked to sign. I look at the job description. It was what I applied for that I was turned back. Right. And then, of course, you, you, you didn't expect me to say that. So I quickly signed, you know, because <laughs> I did the job. So the next day after teaching, I bumped into the guy in the coffee room. I said, do you know, uh, this is what happened. And he's a very strong union guy. He said, I'm going to take this up. And this was good to you know, the, the, the authorities. But it just transpired that it wasn't out of malice, or as people would make it look probably racism, which is the first thing people would normally think of. But it was just that the human resource department tried almost six months to employ an Iranian, you know, lecturer. The immigration department would not allow it. So this time around, they said, they're not going to waste their time, all right? And so, when I then went for a final interview, then I, they said to me, this was the problem. And obviously, because I needed the job, I challenged them. I said, look, I know you are all uh, administrators, university administrators, but I know that none of you work for the immigration department. So all you have to do, if I qualify, ask me to start. If I can't start, then you apply somebody else. They said, OK. So I went to the home office to cut the story short. I was not given a working visa, I was given a resident visa, okay? And so that's what sparked my, my career. And then Andrew Howard, I mean, just as uh, what Joe and uh, Carl would do, you know, their style, which I love very much, this was the guy that pioneered it in me. He just have a way of motivating you to do research. Through this guy, I know that research comes from the heart. Because when I said it in one of my interviews recently during promotion, they didn't believe me, you know? Look, your career can be damaged by those above you for so many reasons, all right? Myself and one, um, uh, what do you call it, a uh, Lebanese student, uh, colleague, we were asked not to do research because it wasn't a research institute, it was a teaching institute. Then they brought somebody from Scotland who was meant to come and revive research and single the two of us out. We received a letter from our dean, said no research. And to make sure that that was the case, gave us teaching load, all right? So we will go in. This is what I tell the younger guys today in Adobe. You know, we will go in Saturday and Sunday because we know no matter how good you are as a teacher, the only thing you can take away with you that will be in your CV is your publication. So we will work Saturday and Sunday we were putting bit of publications, you know, together. And so I owe that to him. Brian Field is the man that taught me. I'm sure he's, he's the one who, <laughs> who read uh, what Professor <laughs> Ofori quoted. He's the one that told me that it's not what you say or do. It's how you say it to people and how you act that is important. Brian can call you into his office and tell you you are a fool and you will thank him for it and go away. <laughs> so only when you come back, you say, look, and you are rushing to go and meet him, you see him smiling. Say, did you forget anything? You say, no, 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 Brian, and he came. So he left for the European Investment Bank, but he never left me. He saw something in me, he was always encouraging me, we were writing articles together, and so on and so forth. Okay, energy crisis. I thought I would start this discussion by referring all of us here, those of us who are old enough, to know the energy crisis of the 1970s in Europe. As you can see, motor cars queuing up, three day working week. That was you know, how it manifested. As you can see here, gas shortages, 
okay? But that was not the first, you know, energy crisis. You had the energy crisis, the first and enduring energy crisis occur in the developing countries. I'm just giving you, you know, the backdrop to my research, the contest, okay? If you look at these women here, look at what they are doing here. That's what the SAS does. So, so the SAS do to qualify for Green Beret. <laughs> they don't even carry as much weight as these women are carrying over such a longer distance, all right? And then some of them will have their children with them at the same time. Look at the age. You have no boundaries, no age limit. They all walk long distances, you know, to gather fewer wood. And it's quite, you know, tasking, especially the security element of it. Look at the age, some of the age of these, of these women. Why? In most of those communities, the younger ones have grown up and they have gone to the city to look for job. But another thing I want you to focus on here, do you see any man here? Any of the men? They are women and children. These children, they walk long distances. And over the time, as fear would become, you know, scarcer, why would scare would become scarcer? Because of urbanization. People are building houses, people are now having to walk long distances to fetch, you know, fewer wood. And I must tell you, I did the same thing, you know, but we never saw it as suffering, we just saw it as a daily routine, you know, and you do, you work into, okay? And you imagine, you walking this long distance and then coming back, it means you would have to leave around 4 a.m. in the morning to come back on time before you, you go to school. And guess what? These are some of the things you will find later. It's in the city. It's not even in rural area. Because most of cities in Africa are rural integrated. Okay? All right? But there's a problem. If you look at Fairwood, you know, it's disappearing fast. If you just look at the, what, what is left, the amount of uh, fuel wood depletion, you know, from 2001 to, tw to 2020, okay? And you look at it here, over 20 million hectares of forest are lost between 1990 and just 2020 alone, okay? And, and you look at the number of people that still depend on fuel wood. 2,400 trees are cut down each minute. That's significant. Okay, if that continues, what are we being told today? That one way of achieving net zero is plant trees, okay? So if you have, you know, most people in the developing countries, we predominate, are cutting down the trees just as much as you plant them in the developed countries, we are in square one. We are not moving at all, okay? And how do they use this? <clears throat> It's not just the disappearance, it's not just the ecological implications that we are talking about, but also there are imminent danger as well, okay? Openly, smoke, suits, et cetera, et cetera, okay? That are breathed in, okay? Now, mostly children are around and they suffer the consequences the most. I'm using Nigeria as an example. Look at the numbers of Nigerians or women, you know, that would die, okay? 93,000, we're talking about 1,000 here, recorded annual as a result of smoke inhale, you know, firewood in Nigeria. Just one country, just one country, okay? 450,000 Nigerian women would die in the next five years. You know, they are all cooking, you know, with firewood, okay? What are the, the signs? chest pain, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Four million people prematurely from innings, you know, attributed to household air pollution globally, four million. And out of these four million, <coughs> you will say <coughs> 20 million, you know, globally, if you multiply that, next five years, we are saying that 20 million people will die in the next, you know, five years, okay? And then use of fuel wood, Again, as we say, contribute massively to deforestation. There's a major problem, a major problem, okay? And then, <clears throat> Nigeria, 95,000 people die annually from open cooking fire. 
Can you imagine? Malaria has killed more people, right? You, you've heard of uh, Big Gay Foundation carrying nets, etc., to try and reduce death from malaria. But fewer wolves related, smoke related, you know, illnesses kill far more people in that country, more than HIV and AIDS. Just as they say here, that carbon monoxide kills, you know, you don't see it. Exactly, these are some of the, the effects. And out of this, if you look at it, 100 million Nigerian households or more depend on fewer wood. It's a major problem. It's a country of more than 200 million, okay? Of all this debt, 500,000 of the four million are children, children, okay? So it's a crisis, it's a challenge, right? And if we put this into context, look at Africa, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, okay? And if you look at that within the global sphere, more than two billion people still use fewer wood, okay? So what do we do? Now if you split that between rural and urban, you will see that even, you just look at Sub-Saharan Africa, in the urban population, they significantly consume fewer wood. Imagine that. You have rural urban migration, and we are told that urbanization rate, especially in Africa and Asia, will predominate, you know, by 2050, more people will be living in, 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 in rural area. If, if I were to take you back, you know, you look at the position of Latin America. Why is it that the share of Latin America in fuel wood consumption is low? Because Latin America has been urbanized for over 100 years. So this is telling you the higher the rate of urbanization, okay, so the use of fuel wood is supposed to be declining. All right, then ask yourself, why is it? You can see some element of you know, reduction here, but why is it that in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, you see the reverse, okay? Totally, around the world, Latin America as well as Asia, China. I want us to pay particular attention to China here. So it means, as a country grows, okay, the share of fuel wood supposed to, to, to drop, okay? Now, policy, what shall we do? Business as usual scenario, you see, CO2 emitted will continue to rise if we continue along this route. But if we take action to reduce this, right, by looking at L L LPG, liquefied petroleum gas electricity expansion scenario, I'm coming to that, I know my friend, <laughs> Aaron is looking at me and say, I'm saying no more gas, he is saying liquefied gas. But if you contest it, we are able to move the whole concept of energy transition, okay? Gradually, you agree with me that irrespective, these are cleaner fuel. So if we are able to move people away from fuel wood, you know, to any of these that are relatively more efficient, you know, we will begin you know, to reverse the impact on global environmental degradation. How do we do this? Look at here. Okay, this is how they use fuel wood at the moment. Okay, what are the abatement measures and what are their uh, uh, potentials? Okay, efficient, you know, stove, like these ones here. Okay, now if I ask you, just sitting down here, and this is why, you know, you need sociologists and anthropologists in everything you do. Science will not deal with this problem alone, all right? Okay, and that's why, you know, the, when I hear uh, 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 my, my colleague here, uh, Professor uh, Issa Chair, who is our Associate Dean for Research, emphasizing, you know, that we need to, you know, look into interdisciplinarity. It is crucial. Here I was involved, you know, in a, a, some of these activities. I will discuss it, you know, later on as we go along with all the efficient, you know, stove that we provided. We came back and found that they were not in use. They were not in use. 
heads of household would not let you know, the women use this efficient stove. If they were to use it, what would happen? It would reduce the times they go fetch firewood, isn't it? Okay? Okay? So, you know, every bad situation, you will always get gainers. <laughs> we found out that for the men, they have built their culture around, you know, and because they choose the women who goes and fetch firewood, you know, at any time that they go. If you have a polygamous, you know, family with uh, four wives and uh, 20 children and et cetera, et cetera, then you have to you know, carry out some kind of management, you know, and rotational activities. So what then happened? We realized that the only way we can get this working was to find other activities that would keep the women away and the children away as well, you know, the, at the same time to create that kind of, you know, space and environment for them to do whatever, you know, uh, was happening. So we looked to building schools, all right? Okay, we, 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 we looked at setting up uh, 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 um, basic businesses, we are tailoring, you know, and all the other, you know, activities that can still achieve that time, you know, duration where people will, will live home. When you talk about the other alternative of liquefied petroleum gas and electricity, this is the reality. We know that 66% of the total global population still have no access to clean energy. And what 1.5 billion people have no access to electricity. And this predominate, you know, in uh, 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 Sub-Saharan Africa you know, m m most particularly. Yet what I said earlier on, it's instructive here. Here is a country, an oil exporting country. It has all the known means of generating energy, yet still has a problem, okay? And to tell you how serious this issue is, these are children, I use this to motivate my students. When students come to me, I couldn't do this, I say, look, you don't know what you have here. This is luxury for you. These children, I said, you see, they are reading under the street light. They could travel five miles to find a street light where they can sit down and read. And you have everything. You are telling me you have headache, earphone, and whatever, all those kind of things. I said, no. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, so I, I tell them, you know, I, I, and I emphasize that. And that's why you see, I make the, the, them know that look, they are competing in the global labor market with these people. And I tell my students, some of them are here. You know, I say when people talk about immigration, racism and all this kind of thing that happen in the workplace, well, it's not someone from Pakistan or Nigeria coming say I must work in this industry. No, there's a manager there. Why would a British employee, employer, employ somebody from Bangladesh or India, you know, instead of you? I say, why? Ask. You know? So I use this to motivate them, but this is very, very serious. Anything could happen to these children. Okay? So how do we then go about talking about electricity? This is it. Just as the problem you have with fear wood is even much more serious when it comes to commercial energy. Look at people queuing up. You can take uh, days off just queuing to get petrol. You look at cars, right? right? Did you see this? <laughs> this is very, it is, all right? Because uh, uh, you, know during, you know during the Second World War, this is exactly what happened. When inflation was, uh, you know, 5,000%. So if you carry your currency in a wheelbarrow, it's in economic history. Because coffee price will change before you go in and come out. Then you come out, you find your money tipped on the ground. They've taken the wheelbarrow to go and bring their own. Exactly the same thing. People now looking for, you know, for petrol. All right? And so everywhere you look, this problem, you know, exists. Okay? So when it comes to uh, uh, policies, if I ask you now, what shall we do to stop fewer wood? 
the first thing that will come to mind is to say, oh, band it. Just ban the use of fear wood. Just like that. That's what normally will come. But you shouldn't. Because let's be realistic. If you are successful in encouraging, you know, a transition from fuel wood to commercial fuel, how many can you do? How much can you achieve? That's number one. The number two, and much more important, is that looking at that trajectory, what sort of fuel will you be encouraging them to? Is it kerosene? Is it gas? Is it electricity? How do you know what the income elasticity is? By how much does the economy, economic growth has to rise for somebody to transit from one fuel you know, to the other? Are there even substitution possibilities between fuel? You know? So you've got to determine all of this before you can begin to implement you know, any kind of, of, of policies, okay? And so, <clears throat> if you look at uh, 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 fuel wood in itself, fuel wood is not the problem here. Fuel wood is not the problem. It's where you get the fuel wood from and how you use the fuel wood that is the problem. Because globally, you have up to about six to seven billion dollars on fewer wood, you know, as, as an economic activity. You heard of sustainable forest management. You heard of sustainable forest management, right? Where you grow trees for a particular purpose, you harvest them, you grow the same tree again, you divide them, it takes time for you to harvest those that are grown up and then you move on. This is the problem, that's the confusion about sustainability. How it is conveyed is critically important. Sustainability did not say or does not say you cannot and you shouldn't develop. It simply says develop in a way that you begin to respect the, 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 the natural environment. What does this mean? You know, to respect the natural environment, natural environment has time for recuperation. Okay? And then you must not deplete the natural resources beyond its capacity to replenish itself. Okay? That's what it is. The ability of nature to regenerate itself. You must not disturb, dis disturb that you know, uh, uh, ability. Okay? And that is what my earlier research was all about. Trying to understand the energy consumption behavior. Right? This is fundamentally important. How do people use energy? When do they use energy? All right? And if you really look at this, People can't form behavior as a result of energy that is available or not available. And uh, I'm not saying this uh, to embarrass anybody here. If you go, when every staff is left the university, I know those who leave their lights on and don't switch their lights off. I know those. When I go to international conferences, I made the point or we're asking the receptionist to check the rooms and see those of us that have their lights on. You know why? You know why? Because in Africa, you don't know when the lights come on, you don't know when the lights goes off. So the best thing is to just leave the lights on. 3 a.m. in the morning, you see the light, everybody jumps up, you start cooking, you know, ironing, etc., etc. All right? So what that simply means Okay, that it dictates your time, you know, and all your activities, you know, around it. Okay, and so I now moved on to uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, issue of sustainability. If you look at sustainability, it just came on at this time, all right? Before, all that there was was how do we decouple how do we decouple economic growth from energy consumption? The whole idea is you reduce the amount of energy consumption. It does not necessarily stop you from achieving growth. That was the emphasis, right? Earlier on, it was global warming, 
and climate change. By the way, it is still global warming because the last conference we just had uh, at the United Nations Habitat, you know, we discovered that the problem now is not so much CO2. CO2 is there, it's a major problem, but a bigger problem is occurring, okay? Which is what? Water vapor. Water vapor is even more damaging. How does water vapor occur? Sea warming, isn't it, right? The sun hits the sea, water vapor rises. It, does a, it has the same effect as CO2. So it's still global warming, you know? And so <clears throat> the first uh, uh, area that I came across here was, you know, global warming and climate septics. You know, people believe that yes, how we use the environment is not the major cause of global warming. And then it was easy for me to transfer that. The rapid rate at which natural resources uh, 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 disappear and look at the consequences for biodiversity and connect that to the built environment. It was very easy for me to do because if you look at the whole the concept that uh, 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 word sustainability is not within the confine of uh, 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 <clears throat> environment at all. It's a term that was borrowed from development economics. The word sustainability came about in the 70s when foreign direct investment coming into Africa on projects. Once the money dries up, the technical assistance stops, the project dies a natural death. And so all development agencies decided that the only project that will be supported from now on will be sustainable project. That's project that is able to continue beyond is what financial and technical assistance. And don't forget, earlier on we had the Matus that was worried about the rate at which population was rising and the impact it's going to have on the, on the environment. And that is why you have this debate today between strong sustainability and soft sustainability. Strong sustainability, which is ecologically based, says, you know, put an end to anything that would destroy the environment. Whereas, because the whole idea is the neoclassical assumption, okay, that market would deal with externalities. If there are problems as a result of, you know, we consuming these goods and services, you know, the market will be able to deal with it. It will increase price, people will buy less of that, and then it will slow down. The assumption there, very dangerous one, it means that, look, we can carry on as usual. We have the knowledge. We have the ability to circumvent nature. You know, after all, you know, we were producing uh, fiber. We can replicate nature, okay? But the argument is there are certain eco service, uh, ecosystem services that you cannot replicate. Clean air, you know, you can replicate that. And other, you know, essential services of that nature, okay? And that debate, is what transformed into this climate skepticism, that there's no connection between man-made activities and global environmental degradation, okay? So you all read this book, Man-Made Global Warning, <laughs> Unraveling the Dogma, all right? By this uh, 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 Swedish author, I think, who had um, a stint, I think it was Oxford, Okay, at the same time, it came out, it was a major, major uh, 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 um, book at that time, you know, discrediting the connection between man-made global warming and, uh, and the environment. His opening statement was the mother of all environmental scares. That's what he said about, you know, what was happening then. He said there's no connection between the environmental uh, issues that were unfolding then and you know, uh, 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 man's activity. What I did 
looking at the whole uh, 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 evidence and debate, was to agree with him first. That's what you do. Remember what I told you, what Brian Field said. It's not what you say and what you do, it's how you do it. You know? So I agree with him that yes, there are these doubts. But I was able to point out things that are happening in different parts of the world at the same time, you know, that you cannot possibly explain. Okay? And the same thing with you know, climate change, the natural hazard, I looked at that. that the, the, uh, uh, the fourth one, when I started writing and people see that I was bringing development, environment, and law together, because the question I was asking them is that none of those things, just the question I asked three weeks ago, you know, when I served as a global expert uh, uh, under UN uh, Habitat in Bilbao, Spain, Everything that was discussed there, I said to them, I can point to, you know, four, four years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we have these policies. They are there. The issue is, uh, why are they not being implemented? Okay? Right? And so that led me to looking f generally into areas of what, you know, uh, sustainable development where I was now looking at the scope and limits to sustainable development in Africa, in the developing countries, looking at issues of public policies, and uh, looking at energy, technologies, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And then here, then I was being contacted by United Nations Environmental Program to present uh, an African positional paper, you right, on sustainability, which I co-wrote with my my colleague, uh, Ruemilia in OPD in South Africa, for the simple reason that they said they will not allow an African who lives in Europe to write a positional paper about these issues in Africa. They are very, very uh, you know, emphatic that because we live outside, we have lost total touch with Africa. So anyway, we wrote that you know, together. And then start looking at how do we effectively, you know, uh, deal with issues of uh, uh, pollution, whether we should use, you know, uh, uh, command and control law, okay, or incentives, okay? You have to be very careful, right? Okay? And so, I now, after that, I was beginning to look at other ways in which, you know, we can, <coughs> we can uh, 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 further transfer this, you know, into the, the built environment. Okay, why? Because the built environment is an intensive consumer of natural resources. There's a very, very strong connection there. Okay, All right? Strong connection between the built and the natural environment. Okay, if you look at, for example, uh, the amount of resources they consume, world energy 40%, total global raw materials, 30% is consumed, you know, by the construction industry. Solid waste, you know, 25% responsible, and then 40% of CO2 emission. All right? Okay. So which means what? If you put all of this together, if you concentrate trying to deal with issues of CO2 and climate change within the built environment, at least you have a target, you know, to... To, to, to pursue, all right? And then 75% of all the factors, this is well established, of all the factors known responsible for global environmental degradation are traceable to the built environment in one form or the other. How we create buildings and cities, how? is fundamentally important. It would determine, you know, how you, the types of energy you you, uh, 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 you consume the interlinkages between cities and, you know, between rural areas and cities. What we create buildings and cities with is fundamentally important as well, okay? And <clears throat> with what we create buildings and cities, how we live in buildings and cities is even more important. And if you remember, sometimes things are said you see, we, we tend to interpret it as jokes, right? 
And I say to my student, I say, when you write your dissertation, give it to your parents or your boyfriend and your girlfriend. Don't assume that they know nothing about what you're written about. You are not writing for yourself. You are writing for the understanding of the common person. Most policymakers are not educated. They have political, you know, uh, 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 <clears throat> fails around them. You know, that's what is needed. They need to be able to break this into policy making. All right? Why am I saying this? Look at what uh, Churchill said to us after the Second World War. He said, we shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. He was indirectly warning us, hey, you are building today, be careful. How you build your cities today, what you build your buildings with today will determine the amount of energy you consume and how you consume energy. All right? And so, other reasons why the built environment has to take you know, environmental degradation, natural resource consumption very seriously. Look at energy embodied in raw materials. Just look at it. Concrete, for example. How much energy? And now, you what? You knock down a building. What do we used to do? We get lorries in, take all these to the tea. Okay? Until the European Union put a ban to that. That's why today when you see new buildings, what do they do? They spend time, okay, processing all the bricks. They are now forced to use it as infill. Before, they used to take these things out and then new aggregate will come in. All of a sudden, they find alternative use now for those, you know, elements. Who says that there are distinctions between the three pillars of what sustainability? Once you do that, that's economic efficiency because you are saving resources. That saves a lot of money, you know, in fact. Then you look at uh, timber, plastics, etc., etc. So also, on this other quadrant here, look at how long the resources we have will last. Look at only eight years for some of these facilities. Which means what? It is not only just for the sake of the environment, it's also in the interest of the construction industry to be careful how he uses you know, natural resources if he wants to continue and remain in business. All right? Here, you achieve that environmentally. Look at the benefit in terms of social sustainability because sustainability comes in three pillars. You have the environmental sustainability, economic sustainability, and social cultural sustainability. Now, the relevance and importance of the construction industry is picked up here. Look at it. Of all the sectors, waste, transport, forestry, energy, building, are for the lowest emission reduction opportunities. The lowest affords us greater opportunity than any other sector to begin to reverse the damages to the environment where we can drastically cut our CO2. If we pay attention, sustainable buildings or green buildings, we can reduce our energy by up to 24 to 50% use. All right? So, Population can grow, okay? Where this has been used recently is in California, where local authorities or the state of California says no more energy generating utilities. The only energy that you are allowed to sell to new households will be the energy that you save. And guess, do you know what happened? Energy utility companies now are the ones calling customers. See, when is your vacation? because they are coming to insulate your house to the hilt and gather the amount of energy that they have saved and sell it on. Look at that policy, that stroke of policy. Okay? You can drastically reduce solid waste. Very, very important. So this attracted my interest into this area. But there was a problem. So I hear today the construction industry talking about sustainability and uh, 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 raising a lot of conferences. It was trying to push 
like trying to push a camera ahead through the eye of a needle to convince the construction industry that they have a role to play in enhancing the regenerative capacity of the natural environment and slowing down environmental degradation. Okay? I remember one construction company saying, why is the government asking us to go sustainable? What are they smoking? What, what, which party did they go? Who came up with that policy? All right? That was it. But you look at the measures that the government took to push all this through. All right? Then that uh, led me you know, to writing the first MOOC for uh, 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 the, the, the uh, CIOB, okay? Look at that link there, it is still there. Uh, they are divided into five sections, two hours per week. This, we captured this, you know, in the first few weeks when it started, okay? Then I think it was up to 40,000 people they said they enrolled on it, you know, generally, okay? So you look at it, we have the environmental sustainability breaking it down Little, little things that you can do that can drastically reduce the ecological footprints of your building. For example, what used to happen? Lorries would start bringing in, you know, a lot of goods, okay? And they come in from Leeds, Newcastle, whatever it is, to a site in London, and they leave empty, okay? So you heard of this Pallet UK. What do they do, Pallet UK? Yeah, you come in, okay? Whatever has to be taken back, you are, look, you are moving from here to Newcastle. The company that left those pallets there, they are somewhere in Luton or Stoke on Trent. You pick those pallets and drop it there on your way so that that lorry does not come to London, empty, pack the pallet, and go back. That significantly reduces you know, the energy. And also, what brought about this whole issue? You remember the whole concept of lean construction when it came about, okay? Uh, we, 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 we don't have, uh, need warehouses anymore, et cetera, to try and achieve economic efficiency, again, you know, sustainability. But that obviously had, you know, obvious environmental, you know, implications. Because if you close down your warehouses and just-in-time construction, Anytime you want windows, you call, they deliver it. Anytime you want, look at how many journeys that will be made. So that's why in terms of policy, you have to have a holistic approach, appraisal of your construction policies. And this is where, for example, uh, uh, the best example so far, where you know, sustainability in project management have been achieved, cross rail, okay? Where economic sustainability, the way it's mostly implemented now, is used to drive efficiency, right? That's not all about economic sustainability. Economic sustainability simply also requires you, as a project manager, to begin to ask yourself, how can I use this project to enhance local employment? How can I use this project to enhance gender equality? How many women, you know, in this locality are unemployed? Can I design this building? in such a way that women can feature and work in this building. Can I use this project to train workers as we go you know, along? Okay? When it comes to environmental, you, you look at that. Once you do that, at the same time, you are achieving social sustainability by bringing everybody together you know, and allowing them to take ownership of the building. Okay? All right? I'll give you as an example. Leicester City Council, wanted to build a building for young people, youths, where they can go and relax and take them off the street. They call an architect. The architect simply went there, you know, designed a building, and they built it with no, concentration, uh, that, with no connection at all with end users. It was beautiful. So when it was time to open it up, none of the young people came. After about two, three months, of what? Advertisement. What was the problem? The young people, they came to me. I did the research for them. The young people said, well, look at this building. When you commit crime 
and you are arrested. This is the kind of place they take you to. You know, these people don't like me so much. Why would they build such a building for me? They didn't. What happened instead? Call the, the, the kids in. What do you want? Talk to the architect. They play around. They designed that building. They co-created it. I tell you what, today there's no single graffiti in that building. All right? And so <clears throat> I was uh, uh, looking into this okay, to look at the connection between the built and, and the natural environment and why we need you know, sustainability in this area. Okay? Then I felt many Nigerians would be coming here. And uh, I needed to draw, uh, 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 use uh, 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 a perfect example. Why? Because in most developing countries, we are still struggling to draw connections between what is happening in the environment, environmental degradation, you know, to what is physically happening, you know, uh, uh, in real life. Many reasons for this, superstitions, all other factors, you know, are dragged in. If you look at this, is the federal capital territory it was a virgin land, and look at how it's been built up. Nobody cared to ask what would be the impact of this. Okay? What happened to the ecosystem that lived here? The world does not belong to we human beings alone. You know? <laughs> so we all share in this. But nobody cared. All right? Now, the sand of making this concrete, where did they get them from? You see, they, 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 they got this thing from the River Niger. You see, this was the River Niger, you know, normally, okay? Look at when the rain fall, the flood, okay? Why do you think this is? Sand slows down water. It absorbs water itself. When you dig all this water up, you turn them to concrete. It becomes almost like, you know, a, 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 a tamarind street, and the water will run faster and faster. And this is what you have. Okay? Just look at these people were not expecting this. These are not the kind of people who have insurance. These are people's life savings. It could have taken more than 50 years to build some of these houses. Because there is no what? Unlike in the developed countries, all right, you don't have speculative development. Okay? So you, you save money to build and you gradually expand. Okay? Now, this is something about climate change. Why? It is extremely difficult. Okay? And that is also why I look at when people talk so enthusiastically about resilience, resilient infrastructure, all these beautiful semantics that are used to describe this phenomenon. Right, I look and listen. The problem with climate change is this. You don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know how it's going to manifest. And you don't know where it's going to happen. If it starts happening the same way every year, yes, human beings, we can prepare for it. I understand there's a city in China where it has not rained for almost 15 years. Almost 10 miles away, desert has been receiving six inches rain, you know, for over five, six years. Do you move a city to the desert and the desert back to the city? No. So what that simply means is that let us not rest in the hope that, look, we can solve this problem by tweaking this technology or bringing this technology. We have to start looking at what we use, how we use it. Do we really need all of this? Why am I saying this? This is Lagos. Look at Lagos, 1984. Look at how it is built. Just 2002, about 17 years later or whatever, look at Everywhere built. 2017, look at the built up area. Expanding. I traveled from uh, one part of Nigeria to the other. 
I was shocked. There are no distance between Jebode and Lagos anymore. When you go through the other side, a place called Lepe, I was visibly shocked. And what are these houses they are building? You know, law. Okay? They're not, they're not thinking about density. Okay? They're not building up with vertical buildings. No, just urban sprawl. Okay? And then look at what happens. What do you call this? Adaptation? <laughs> yeah, adaptation. Well, you know, you talk about uh, you know, climate adaptation. Okay? So they have, they have no choice. You know, a man must do what a man has to do. They, they have to drink <laughs> where they have to socialize. Okay? And then look at, look at this yeah. completely. And it will take about six months or whatever for this to go up. All right? Now look at this. These people have no insurance. All right? Okay? So this becomes what? Dead object. Okay? All right? Now to my frustration, to my frustration, and which also look at some of the work that I've been involved in recently. We have architects, we have built environment professionals in the same countries. Look at the type of houses that they are building. Right? Look at it. Just look at it. Look at how resource intensive it is. I want you to look out for any kind of features of alternative energy or whatever. You look at it. In broad daylight, they are using, uh, you know, electricity to this level. There are some of my friends that have similar houses. Like I'm not trying to shame you, but <laughs> <laughs> when you live here, you see, look at the refrigerator. Right? They are trying to replicate Europe in Africa. All right? But there's nothing wrong with that. But replicate Europe in Africa sustainably. I'll be glad if, this, if they can take me to where they have solar energy, wind energy, to capture any of these. Designing buildings using daylighting, you know, and so on and so forth. Okay? This is another one. Just listen to this. All right? You look at this. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And this is not just uh, a whole of this area in Lagos. Man, it's going to take you now to the bedroom. Excellent. All right. Exactly. <laughs> and, and you might you might think this is funny. Hey, there's a, a friend of mine here. I'm trying to look for him. Uh, whether he's here, when he visited uh, my mother in Nigeria, he made a point of coming all the way to come and see me. He says, "Is that your house in Nigeria?" I say, "Yes." He said, for a professor? No, that cannot be your house. I said, what do I need? What kind of house do you expect me to build? He said, ah. I said, I don't live there. Mm. My mother is uh, 105 at the time he went. The children have left home. Why do I need to build 10 bedrooms and whatever, and nobody is living there? And to those of you that know the eastern part of Nigeria, mm -hmm. these houses are there, completely empty. Goats and chicken are living in them. All right? Now, so now I look at this, okay? This, you, can, you, can, you can design your whatever like this so that you can prevent runoff water, et cetera, et cetera. Bringing in, you know, measures that can save the environment, okay? 
And so this also informed most of my work in this area where I have moved, looking at how do you recycle you know, buildings, okay? How do you recycle building products and to capture the embodied energy, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And this is very, very uh, 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 important. Uh, uh, I've collaborated with uh, some of my students here. These are all, you know, Q1, you know, journals, for example. And uh, apart from that, I've su supervised a number of PhD students here. I'd like to highlight this uh, student, uh, you know, as my, uh, as Professor Ofori said, uh, we are not just doing this inaugural lecture for, for nothing. It's an occasion for us to demonstrate to you what we can do at LSBU. Okay? This student did his PhD under my supervision, and his PhD came third in the world. Okay? That decision was made in, uh, in Australia. We just submitted the PhD and so on and so forth. He is a dean in one of the universities in Saudi Arabia. He's working with the United Nations. Okay? And because part of our PhD, we have training program that imbibes certain qualities in, in our student. Okay? And so, from here now, when I came here, some of the young people that have been uh, uh, employed uh, have sort of uh, put some uh, ginger into my beer because uh, people like uh, Roy, uh, Roy Jean uh, from China and Edmondo from Brazil and myself, uh, he comes from a very technical background. He's looking at digitalization, you know, how you can use uh, um, recycle aggregate and turn them into other, you know, construction products by mixing concrete with plastics, right? Makes it lighter, okay, and stronger. And look at what we could use that for. You know, local authorities in this country, they spend so, so much money replacing pavement bricks. You know, what we have is a hundred times stronger than what conventional bricks are. Okay, same thing, we can use it for slate uh, roofing, you know, those kind of whatever. For me, I'm looking at the environmental benefit as well as the economic, you know, and social uh, sustainability impact of this project. Because people, you don't require PhD or KGBCI letters against your name to buy a truck and begin to pick up aggregate and take it to a place where you can sell it, et cetera, et cetera. So it creates jobs, it creates opportunity. Those that pick uh, uh, plastics, the same thing, you know, can get, you know, involved, okay? And so that's, uh, that's that, and these are some of the grants that we have, uh, you know, we have secured. Uh, that's the project that uh, 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 George talked about, okay? Because sustainability, as I said, has a social element. How you produce building is fundamentally important, right? Construction industry is dangerous. Okay, more people die on construction site than any other, you know, sectors. Mm -hmm. So you will need to make it safe. Okay, now this project, about 17 countries in Southern Africa, we saw because of their quest for development, a lot of multinational companies are growing in there. All right, but if you look at their practices, it's unethical. All right, a case in point here, I'm sure all of you would have seen that, enjoyed it, you know, during the World Cup. Look at the way they were savaging. You know, Qatar, I just sat down and laughed. Some said they were not going. Now, let anyone here tell me one construction company that is indigenous to Qatar. Tell me. These were all giant construction companies from Britain, from America. If they cannot replicate what they do back home in other jurisdictions, rather than take ownership of that and say, look at what our companies are going to do you know, in other countries, and call them to other, they were blaming Qatar. All right? So there are various things that we can do. All right? So uh, I've started working in that area now. Uh, here, where I've just, myself and another of my colleagues, uh, just contributed a chapter here looking at the issue is not coming up with so much with sustainable materials, recycling. The issue is who is going to, 
you know, use sustainable material in a building worth 100 million, 150 million, when there are no standards established. All right, okay. There are so many, you know, products out there. I remember sharing a platform with the chairman of the largest cement company in the world, you know, where he said that, look, they produce sustainable uh, uh, cement in Belgium for 10 years now, but there's been no uptake. That was in Nigeria, okay? And so the government, everybody needs to come in. It's not just talking about, you know, uh, 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 <clears throat> just talking about sustainability. It has to be, you know, backed up, okay? So I'm rounding up now. Future research and scholarly activities. As you said, I'm involved with United Nations Habitat. Um, my engagement with them started in 2012 and uh, 2013, when they said they were struggling with someone to look at the impact of environmental sustainability and prosperity of cities, okay? So they gave me that chapter to write. We turned out to be chapter 2.5. So I wrote that chapter, but I also learned something there. When I submitted my first uh, 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 transcript, you know, and uh, they just called me in and they laughed for five minutes. I couldn't understand why they were laughing. You know, I, they, said, they said, oh, look, this, 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 this kind of thing is not for professors or academic or whatever. Go and write, rewrite this chapter in a way that the ordinary chairman or local authority in Kisumu, they mentioned some local villages, who have never been to school, but it's a political heavyweight, can read this, understand it, and enjoy it. And that taught me a lesson. After the successful submission of that, they appointed me to their international advisory board. We produced series of reports, the 2024. Uh, um, uh, uh, World Cities Report is on. We are meeting again uh, between the 4th and the 7th, you know, or sorry, 6th and 9th of, of June, okay, to look at what goes in there. We look at 491 cities around the world, look at how they've achieved, you know, or implemented most of the United Nations sustainable, uh, sustainable goals, et cetera, et cetera. These are some of the meetings. This is the one we've just held now in Bibao. Uh, here, I was representing not just the World Cities Report now, uh, as well as uh, LSBU, but this was to another combined activity by the United Nations uh, uh, themselves. This was, uh, you know, two, two years, you know, ago, okay? Now I would like to continue my activities. In line with what I've just said, uh, I go giving uh, uh, keynote speeches. This one was to the uh, real estate you know, body in the whole of West Africa. This was carried by CMB Arrow. And then uh, here, the Green Hub Africa was in line with what I said earlier on, that there's a disconnect between symptoms of environmental degradation and local you know, environmental uh, events. People were not able to link the two. So this is a, a media platform that you know, links all these things happening you know, to local economy. You can see some of the activities we've had. This was on Earth Day, and that's me there. And these are, you can see those people there. And again, this is another year. I like to continue with that. I like to, when I'm free, if the government called as they ask of me to look at how, you know, the industry, the construction industry in the UK can build better after COVID. I was able to bring in my colleagues here, Isa and Aaron, to participate with me, and we looked at that. One of the things we found out that there's no platform that brings, you know, investors, you know, innovators, contractors together. Everyone is acting, you know, in a, in a silo. And we want to try and, uh, and break that, okay? And so, I'm rounding up now. Now, when you see this picture, what comes to your mind? 
What comes to your mind? You, you think you, ha you owe, you have a duty to protect the environment? Yeah. Okay? Then who are you then? How do you define yourself within this realm? Right? Not to waste our time again. You are a main custodian of the natural environment. You are a custodian. If our forefathers abused the environment the way we are using it today, what is it that we are going to leave for future generations? And that's what brought about the inter and intergenerational equity debate within sustainable development that defined the whole concept of sustainability. Okay? Now, what does this require of us? What does this require of us? To leave the world better than we found it for future generations so that they can also fulfill their own needs. I thank you all for coming, and please go green. <laughs>